March of 2020, it was really a very changing time for so many of us, wasn't it? It's kind of hard to believe it was uh, just a year ago. And for so many different people, it had so many different dimensions and leading forth. For me, there was something very, very unique in March 2020 that happened. Charlie Clough and I were on our way back. We were flying from Houston back to Baltimore, and it was on March the 12th. So it was just prior to all of the big changes being made in our country on the 15th, and there was a number of things that were going on. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but as we were getting on the plane and we were getting settled and we were sitting there, uh, there was one of the flight attendants walked by me. And I sort of caught her eyes and we looked eye to eye. And do you ever feel a connection with somebody that you just can't maybe explain? But that was what happened to me that day. I just... And when that normally happens, it's, it's somebody that's a new creation in Christ as well, that we're sort of making a, a recognition there. So she walked on by, and Charlie and I continued just to, to chat and get sort of settled in. And then our plane took off, and we were on our way, and there was a lot going on in my mind at that time. And I just felt... God, I just need your wisdom. I need your wisdom as to where to go, what to do. Maybe a lot of the things that was going on with the Nigerian songwriter. So I decided on my way back, I was going to read the book of Proverbs. So I went to Proverbs 1 and started there and just started reading through and The flight attendants were taking care of their duties, and we had another one that was attending to Charlie and I. But this one kept walking past me. And I would see her, she would see me, she would look down, and I had my Bible there, and I was just reading along, and everything was going on. They took our drink orders, and we took those, and uh, another delivery came, and so Charlie and I were sitting there. And by this time, I had gotten to Proverbs 11 as I was just kind of reading on, and we were kind of really steadying and out. And you know how they'll start coming around and they'll start picking up a few things here and there. Well, this flight attendant, she walked up to right where I was, and she stopped, and Charlie's shaking his head, and she reached down, and she grabbed my Bible pages. She turned back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and she put her finger there, and she didn't say anything, and then she walked away, and I thought, well, I know most angels show up as men, but I'm kind of wondering if maybe the altitude, you know, there's something going on here because this is incredible. So she goes on up and I turn to Charlie and Charlie probably can remember my face because he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, Charlie, you'll never believe what just happened. And So we keep going, and then I decide uh, we're sort of leveled off. They've done all their responsibilities, and then they're settled in the front. And I said, I've got to go talk to this young woman. So I got out of my chair, and I walked up to the front, and there she was, and she was seated with another flight attendant in the front of the airplane, and they have the two seats there. Well, they were seated there, and they were buckled in. And I just walked up to her and I said, "Uh, can I have a word with you? And her eyes got so big, like I'm sure it was like, this has broke all protocol to reach down and touch my Bible and to do this and do that. And the other flight attendant that was sitting next to her unbuckled and said, here, have my seat, jumped up and was gone. (laughs) So I don't think anybody knew what was happening. So I sat down, I buckled in and I said, Let me tell you kind of what's going on. And we started talking. 
Well, come to find out, she is a millennial. She is a new creation in Jesus Christ. And she had said to me, you know, I'm just so tired of the shallowness of all the things I've been doing. I've been here, I've been there, I've done this, I've done that. And she said, God is just doing like we just saw, just an incredible new thing in my life. And she referenced Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And we talked about where I was, what was going on with me, what was going on uh, with her. And I wanted just to read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, or obviously quote it because you know it. It's trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways. Acknowledge him. Uh, lean not to your own understanding, and he will direct your paths. And I flip those two things around. But the important thought was it was just trust in me. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me. And I am going to direct your steps. You know, as I think about that, I, I can't believe what was ahead of me at that point. And none of us really did, did we? Then all of a sudden we hit the 15th and everything was changing. And my faith, my trust, my belief um, was tried. It was tested in so many different ways. And we all have been on this journey together here. And so many of you that are here were a part of God's plan and why you would be here in this journey. And I cannot tell you how many times I have quoted Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 over this last year. One of the things when I get to heaven I want to do is ask God how many times. Because it's multiple times a day. Because I haven't known, you know, tent meetings, Christmas Eve services, transitions, uh, you know it. But I was always going back to that. And I didn't fully understand, but I knew I could just trust in him. You know, something that I thought about this morning, and then we'll kind of move into our time a little bit deeper, but you know what I thought about today and I hadn't thought about for the last year? I thought about me and I thought about what God was preparing me for. You see, when we first went into the time that I was standing up here and I was uh, doing messages and then we were putting them on YouTube and the whole Brooks had all kinds of animals out there and cutouts and everything, which you guys didn't really ever see. Well, Buck did. He's smiling. There was giraffes out there, all kinds of stuff. But I wasn't sure where all was going to go. And I thought about, like, for me. But, you know, I never thought about her till this morning. I wonder what happened to her. If she's not an angel, then did she lose her job? through the airline industry? Was she furloughed? Wonder what became of her. You know what I did today? I prayed for her. She told me as I explained our church to her where we were, she said, I'm based in Charlotte. But she says, I'm in and out of Baltimore a lot. And she wrote down our church name, where we were. She said, one day I want to visit your church. I've looked for her since that time. And it will not surprise me when she comes to our church one time to visit with us. You see, I think all these thoughts are a perfect providential setup for the book of Habakkuk. It is relevant for us today and what it really means and what is behind me to trust in the Lord with all your heart to not lean to your understanding, but to truly trust in him. So I want to invite you guys, if you would, to please go with me in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, whatever form you want to choose or translation, to the new uh, King James Version is where I'm going to, but wherever you want to go to the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1.1, and we're going to begin a pastoral 
expositional, explanatory journey through what is called, this is amazing, one of the most penetrating books of the Old Testament with a proclamation we're entitling the book of Habakkuk, an overview. And Michael, if you would cue it right now. I know a lot of us don't know where that book is. So you've got 30 seconds on the Jeopardy countdown. I would suggest you go to Matthew and work your way back. Because if you try to go from Genesis forward, you're not going to find it. So we got 10. If you do have a Dr. David Jeremiah Bible like mine, it's on page 1227. So if you want to uh, turn there. But with that, you guys, we really do ask God's richest blessing upon our time here this morning together. We have the revelation of God and from God. And man has their human speculation, which we'll really refer to a little bit later. But we need the Holy Spirit to illuminate what it is that he wants to show us today. And uh, we would pray that our interpretation is going to be clear and accurate and really lead to a total transformation in the way that we're living, even as we do work our way through uh, this opportunity of us considering the book of Habakkuk and just its, its opening over view. By way of explanation, we're just going to make uh, four pastors' observations here on the book of Habakkuk. And uh, the first one that we want to start with is who. And it's kind of really important in one sense to sort of establish that. If you're at Habakkuk 1.1, if you're still turning there, you can just kind of keep on trying to find it. But this is what it says. The burden or pronouncement, or it could say oracle, which the prophet Habakkuk saw. The New Living Translation says it this way. I kind of like this uh, way it was worded. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. You see, that phraseology really identifies the book as God's revelation through the prophet. And also in chapter 3 and verse 1, it identifies Habakkuk, he does as the writer, says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. So the author identifies himself in this book as Habakkuk the prophet. And really it's a special designation that he was a professional prophet in one sense. And it's really amazing that there's a lot of people who think he was possibly a Levite because of how the book ends with the instructions for the choir director would have been one who would have been involved in the leadership of, of worship in the temple and just so vitally important. Also along those lines, it seems that with just the simple introduction of the prophet Habakkuk, uh, and not really a whole lot more, he, he was known. People knew uh, who he was, and he was a contemporary with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zephaniah. The word Habakkuk, his name means one who embraces. I really love that. Because as we're going to see and as we make our way through and as we talked about Hebrews 12 so many times, we embrace the race. And what's going to get set out before him is the race that he's called to. And he is going to embrace that. But also he will be embraced by the true and the living God. We do know he was a prophet of Judah. And one of the things I really loved about him and do love about him is his language is just so rich and it is, it's full, it's figurative. The way he's uh, put his structure together, it really shows a very high literary understanding in his place. 
And I love what one man said, his hatred of the immorality and social breakdown that sin causes also demonstrates his deep spiritual concern. His concern for God, his concern for God's glory and his concern for men. It's a very interesting note here in this incredible book that most of the prophets, when we come to them, um, maybe a little different with Jonah too, but what they do is they speak uh, to the people for God. But what we have here is we have Habakkuk in a dialogue with God. Very, very rich for us to really be able to, to embrace. His writing is more like a, uh, a psalm, or it's more like the wisdom books that we read in Proverbs and others. And as we said, he's extremely sensitive, and I did quote earlier that he did pen one of the most penetrating of all the Old Testament books. I did want to make this mention before we, we move to our, our second point is as an encouragement to us, there's one thing that we really need to recognize here. He knew the scriptures. And that's an encouragement for us. Our minds need to be renewed by the word of God. We need to be disciplined and it's reading, it's studying. We've talked about that. And so crucially important, particularly in this time, in this season, and it was for him. And not only was that, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, correct? So he was a deep man of faith. And we'll see that as we, we work our way through. Second point is the when. Behind me is just a historical timeline. There's a whole lot of different thoughts. The one thing that we know for sure is the time reference seems to be just prior to the Babylonian invasion of Israel. It, it was really, or Judah, it was just an imminent event. So it seems that we could put it at least between 609 and 597 B.C., but probably it was about 605 or 607 that this book was written. How amazing it is that a book that could be written then would be so relevant, so timeless and so powerful as we're going to see for us now. Habakkuk wrote in a time of international crisis, the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, they were right on the doorstep but also a time of national corruption. <clears throat> Habakkuk writes, and there's embedded in here is just lament, troubled over the decay, the violence, the greed, the fighting, uh, the perverted justice, we could say, all of that that was surrounding him in his day. In a world of, of chaos, and I think this is so important, because we live in that day too. He spoke with absolute clarity. He knew what he knew. And he powerfully spoke in that regard. This little book, it is as relevant today as the apps that are on your phone. To just click whichever news app you want to be on and whatever pops up. It's almost just as relevant now as it was, as I said, back then. And the things that will pop up for us or television, 24-hour news that just continues to cycle through. Well, hopefully that leads you to question, well, why is this book written? And then really just a simple way, we'll build upon it, but it was really written to encourage and to stimulate, to stir. And I'm going to say two things here. Number one is faith. Trust in God. And we're going to see that as we work our way through. God is revealing himself here in the midst of all that's going on as the one who is all powerful. 
when things are changing and chaotic and crazy, isn't it incredible to know that he's all powerful? He's holy. He's sovereign. He's just. He's merciful. And also embedded in all this is he is the all wise God. So it's revealed in who God is himself. But the response to that, it's encouraging faith and praise in the true and living God. I want to read what one writer wrote. I just didn't want to try to rephrase it or work with it. It just just powerfully puts an exclamation point on the why. Why do you allow injustice? Habakkuk asked God. Why do you tolerate evil? God did not answer Habakkuk's questions directly. Instead, God gave Habakkuk a vision of his deity. We've been talking about that. In the midst of chaos, we need to see him. Tune out the noise, the shiny things, the distractions to take our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. God just turned Habakkuk's eyes to himself. Whether or not the prophet understood God's ways, he could safely trust him. Habakkuk's questions echo in the hearts of all God-fearing people. The book of Habakkuk does not offer easy answers to the problem of evil in the world. Instead, it gives sound reasons to exercise faith in the sovereign, holy, and just God who will ultimately bring justice to his world. Make no mistake about it, his promises will be fulfilled. And the end will be, as he said, the end will be in the book of Revelation. This we know. And Habakkuk lived based on what he knew. That leads us to the what that we actually have in this book. The major theme that we talked about is God himself, his character, and the specific attributes that we mentioned. You know else, what else is here? He has a historical plan. And he is working it out. And he has a heavenly purpose. It is his glory. And it is to be filled over the face of the earth. And he has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And he is working and willing and doing in accordance with his plan and his purposes. Under that overarching theme, there's a number of topics that we have here. The first one we've mentioned is faith in God. If there's anything that I will go away with from Habakkuk, and if you in the future think about it, there's a lot of themes, thoughts. Just think of this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If we go away with that one thought, we've achieved an incredible, incredible part of our mission. Also, what's here is righteousness. Uh, a key verse is the righteous will live by his faith. Also, what's here are questions, concerns. You know, God I think delights in our open, honest, humble questions. We'll talk about that. And Habakkuk does that. Oh God, why are you allowing these wicked practices to continue? And then why will you use wicked people to punish your people? It's a kind of an amazing dialogue that sort of goes on here that will explore a little bit. And the, the queries here that the prophet asks about are really some of the fundamental questions 
that all of us find ourselves asking. I was kind of uh, sort of in shock. It was almost like Habakkuk saying, why? And then God gives him his answer that he was going to use the Babylonians to bring about discipline. And then it was, what? How can it be? Seriously? So it's an amazing thing that sort of goes on. And as you can see, it's trusting in the Lord and not our own understanding because he surely could not understand. We have incredible answers that we have from God and how he's going to work through these incredible thoughts. And also the book has just some amazing, amazing verses in it. We'll touch upon those as we kind of work our way through. We've talked about the just living by faith. Paul repeats that. It comes up in Hebrews. Also, Paul speaks of it in Galatians. But also we have here five woes. And these five woes are integrated topics. Two of them have to do with economic injustice. See, that was bothering him. Also, there was labor abuses that were going on, which he knew was wrong. Also, there was just flat out wicked living. And that's a whole nother thought. And then uh, George Bachman so wisely mentioned the other night in our men's study, and we will be renewing that again in May, but it was idolatry. The, the worship of, of someone or something other than God and all those things sort of grip the heart of Habakkuk. Also, you know what's here is prayer and this dialogue with God in the beginning, but then he moves his way to even chapter three and we have an amazing, amazing accounting there and he, he prays and he's really pleading with God and I really couldn't help uh, but think of uh, Miss Carol many times will pray, and it's, it's actually from Habakkuk uh, 3, 2. Oh, Lord, I've heard your speech, and I was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. And so many times Carol has prayed that. It's just amazing. Also, in the midst of all of this, this is a book of hope. It is a book of incredible encouragement. Let me just read what one man said, because he said it better than I can. The prophet Habakkuk penned an unusual message of hope and encouragement for God's people. Though doubts and confusion reign, when sin runs rampant, an encounter with God can turn those doubts into devotion and all confusion into confidence. See, so many times in the chaos and the confusion, we're looking in all the wrong places, right? Instead of just steadfastly looking unto the Lord Jesus, focusing upon Him, running the race that He set before us by faith, trusting and believing in Him, we look at the problem or whatever it might be. See, this is amazing revelation of the solution. This one writer says, worry is transformed into worship. Fear turns into faith. Terror becomes trust. Hang-ups are resolved with hope. And anguish melts into adoration. And that leads us to this incredible topic of praise and the hymn of praise. If you want to look at Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 19, they're, they're really worth us just reading because they're so powerful. We've heard them so many times. I know so many of us have prayed them. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, 
though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls, I will go into great depression. <laughs> is, that, is that what? That's not what it says, is it? If he was focused on those things, if he was centering on those things that were temporal, that would be the next part of that phraseology. No, verse 18 says, yet I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation, which is a pointing forward for us to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the complete plan of God. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like a deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. What an amazing, amazing proclamation of praise. And just real quick, our outline here. The first is the perplexity of Habakkuk 1.1 1, 1 to 2.20. There's problems, he laments, there's questions, there's answers he doesn't understand, there's woes and wondering, worrying, watching and waiting. But then we turn to chapter three, the prayer of Habakkuk. And there we have power, the power of God, the providence of God, praise, worship. And I just love that thought of incredible proclamation. Can you imagine the number of believers that have been encouraged by those verses we just read, that found themselves in that hard place, but yet they were able to turn their attention. Oh, this book, this book is timely. This book is relevant. This book is powerful. And I'm so excited for us to spend the next bit of time proclaiming the truth that's embedded here. So that leads us to, to wrap up, I believe, in a really a powerful way uh, for us uh, today. The incredible thought of Habakkuk and the overview of it. Dolores, I just so appreciate your ministry to me, and I know you're out here somewhere because I saw you walk by. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. You got as far away from me as you could, didn't you? <laughs> And Barry, you're no better, so <laughs> work up. Used to see you right here. So this is what Tony Evans said. Please listen real carefully here. The book of Habakkuk serves as an invitation to look at the who when we don't understand the why. See, that's the key. To look at the who when you don't understand the why. It prompts us to trust in God's sovereignty. Habakkuk invites us to draw near to God even when we don't get all of our questions answered. I would even say or we don't understand. And even when it seems that God is working against us, the book teaches us that we can take our stand and praise God even when we don't grasp what he is doing. He encourages us to live by faith, and he encourages us by the great doxology that he ends with in this book. So as uh, new creations in Jesus Christ, how do we respond by faith? Through Jesus Christ who lives within us and, and by the filling of the Holy Spirit. I wanted to sort of set up the relevance of this book for us. Just a second, if you'll, if you'll let me. And then I'll really give us the powerful applications that I really believe will be life transforming. How about the relevance for today? We're living in times that are changing, aren't they? I can't even keep up with it. It's so rapid. They're challenging. They're confusing. They're, they're chaotic times, right? Internationally, it seems we're in a crisis. Economically, just hanging on by a thread. The health issues all around the world. Injustice. Religious persecution of Christians higher than it's ever been. And how about human trafficking 
and the things that rip our hearts out and the threats, the threats to our just existence that would come from Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. And for us as new creations in Christ, on the doorstep, it seems, of one world globalism and meetings uh, right now going on about pulling all of that together, even as spoken in Revelation. How about national corruption? Let's just take that for a second. You guys, I want you to pray for me. Because these are not easy days, nor are there easy messages. You see, what characterizes us right now is what God calls, not what I call, sin. Uh, Barney Fife said that you can never speak too much about that subject. <laughs> Today, it doesn't seem churches even speak about that subject. And that is the problem that Jesus Christ came to resolve. You see, sin destroys individuals. Sin destroys families. It destroys society. It destroys nations. It destroys the world. And sin, biblically at its root, is just independence from and rebellion towards God and his authority. Sin is saying to him, this man will not rule over me. In utter defiance and finds its root in the evil one himself. And we're surrounded as new creations in Christ by so many that stand in that spot. The fruit of sin is lawlessness, immorality, evil. We've seen it unfolding, and Buck said it best, it's just plain out wicked. And as George said, immorality. Just a couple of headlines I wanted to give us that really, I think, are just right out of our news cycle. And maybe they would have been related to by Habakkuk. Why, oh God, do you allow political deception, corruption, the inequality act to be set out before us? Immigration distortion, unconstitutional direction, neglect and ignorance, overreach in so many different kinds of ways. How about educational indoctrination? Critical race theory, which is Marxist inspired. The 1619 Project, misinformation on the founding of America. How about the economic? I couldn't even think of a rhyming word here, but just, just to me, it just seems like economic irresponsibility. How about the social perversion? Cancel culture. And it just continues. How about gender identity? Who would have ever thought we wouldn't know what a male and a female was? And we would add the LBGTQ and not that we don't have compassionate, loving hearts and want, but you know what I'm talking about. Religious freedom progressing and its destruction. Woke ideology and, and churches abandoning God's revelation for human speculation. Putting man's words over what God says or rewording what God says to fit what they want it to say. Judicial preconceptions health, medical, 
questions, confusion, misinformation. And I think the thing that breaks my heart the most is abortion. If I was to ask God why, that's probably my big why from Habakkuk. 63.5 million innocent children's lives taken since 1973. You see, God is the God of life. There's a lot of things that may happen. That's one I really struggle with and in all of those different forms and how that's really going on. 2,300 children a day, 36 per second. So, 2021, the prophet Michael. (laughs) Why? I don't understand. But you know what God says to me? Michael, I'm sovereign. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm just. I'm all powerful. I'm all wise. Michael, I've got this. I'm working everything out after the counsel of my own will. And I'm working everything together for your good. Amen? Amen. We have to believe it. Like Rachel said earlier, it's not just a matter of hearing it, but us believing it. And being a Habakkuk, embrace God and embrace his, his truth. But then I say, when? How long? Is this going to go on? And it's even intensifying. It's even getting worse. But you know what he says to me in the context of this is, there's a time. Michael, there's a season for everything under the sun. And I will make everything perfect in its time. And when you look at the back of the tapestry, when you're in glory, you're going to say, oh God, your way is perfect. And I'll have maybe a fuller, better understanding. Wait, rest. And then maybe the final thought is the thought of what? What do we do in the meantime? There's so many different things that are the what. But I believe the simple answer to that is one, God says, trust me. The what is focus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Run the race that he has set before you. Not looking to the left, not looking to the right, not looking at the issues or the problems. Yes, we can glance at them. Be alert, be awake. Like I had mentioned spiritually, but fixed on him. And then function by faith. Ronnie in front of me, get good at believing at who he is and at what he says about us and what he has called us to, what he has promised. I can't say to you guys that we may not have some really hard roads ahead of us. That's why I ask you to pray for me. Because I believe there are maybe some really hard roads ahead for me, even in the proclamation of this message in and of itself. But trust. From, as Jeff Wynell says, the real Bible, lean on, trust, and be confident in me, we could say with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge me, and I will direct and make straight and plain your path. Our praise team is going to close us, and I want to invite them to come up and get in their places. 
But I want you to get your pen out and a pencil or something to write with because I want you to write this quote down and remember it. This is from one of my favorite writers. It's Oswald Chambers. And this is what Oswald Chambers said. Even providentially this last week. Faith never knows where it's being led. Rachel mentioned that with Abram earlier. There may be some of those that we do know, but faith never knows where it is being led. But listen, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. It knows and it loves. It's like me taking the hand of my children when they were young and just say, follow me. And they just walked right with me because they knew and they knew their father loved them. Eternal and everlasting father, we come today with a very heartfelt, personal, pastoral message. I would pray today that if there would be one soul in this room that has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just mightily work in their life and they would just say right here, right now, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that they would receive life in His name. I remember the day you totally changed my life. I didn't exactly know what to say, and nobody told me what to say. But I know your Holy Spirit put words in my mouth, and I've never been the same. Or maybe someone's here that just needs to really say, Lord, afresh and anew, I surrender. I'm going to choose to live by faith in the Son of God who loves me. In new and fresh ways, present myself as a living sacrifice. Oh, Spirit of the living God, as we heard earlier, you're here. You're working. Do what only you can do. Change our lives into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And as we embark on this book, bless us exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ever think, imagine, or dream. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Incredible way for us to end today, to begin this incredible journey of all men. I am so blessed, blessed by God and blessed by you. And I pray that God will bless you exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever think, imagine, or dream. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I love you guys. Have a great week, everybody. Mm -hmm.